Hello again, Art History class. I hope all of you are doing fantastically well as we begin our venture together. Today, we actually want to talk about where did we humans come from? What is the accomplishments early on that we do? Are we special versus anything else that's out there in the universe that we know of, or anything else even here on Earth? And so over here, we actually have Rodin's the thinker sitting here thinking, are we any different? Are we any special? Is there anything different about us than a dolphin or a dog? or a chimpanzee, or some of the other animals that share 99% of our DNA? And that's one of the questions that we actually have to ask ourselves today. So we think through the process. So I wanna show you a few videos that talk about the origination. And one of the first ones that I wanna show you is this. We have a battle that's basically taking place between science and religion. And that battle is what is the origination of us? Did we emerge from evolutionary standards or did God create us in his own image? Depending upon your religion and how strictly you believe within your religion, it's fairly interesting to look at some numbers from the United States. First off, God created humans in their present form. This number right here, 46% of Americans believe that. So that's almost half. So that basically means that they are denying science on this particular issue. Science is pretty clear with the Big Bang Theory. God guided the evolution of humans. That's the second largest group at 32%. Now that of course denies evolution because evolution is not guiding the process. That is basically what we would call intelligent design, another version of a different version of creationism, that God guided the process so they weren't random selections, um, but that God knew what was going on. Gallup poll from 2012 then, if you look down here, God had no part in human existence. That literally is the notion that shows up for only 14% of the population. And so that does mean that science is losing this battle currently as we look at whether science is right or religion is right. We can look at the case kind of within both um, dimensions, whether we look at creationism, intelligent design, pure evolution as it's kind of founded. That's something that's an interesting feature within the United States. Our numbers are much, much, much lower than almost every other industrialized nation on the planet. So let me give you an overview of what the Big Bang is like if you do not know. Our whole universe was in a hot, dense state and nearly 40 million years ago, extension started way back in the land of Cleotros, we did it to the end of all the fellows, we built the wall and the pyramids, science is to be around in the history, it all started with a big bang. From one of the most popular TV shows of the last 20 years, The Big Bang Theory, gives us this overview where humans are very much at the center. But if we actually go back and actually look at what the Big Bang Theory is and where we actually come in, it's a pretty amazing feature. So here's a TEDx talk or a TED Ed talk on specifically the development of the universe. And you'll note humanity is basically not mentioned. Why? Because we are very new to the party. The universe. Rather beautiful, isn't it? It's quite literally got everything, from the very big to the very small. Sure, there are some less than savory elements in there, but on the whole, scholars agree that its existence is probably a good thing. Such a good thing that an entire field of scientific endeavor is devoted to its study. This is known as cosmology. Cosmologists look at what's out there in space and piece together the tale of how our universe evolved what it's doing now, what it's going to be doing, and how it all began in the first place. It was Edwin Hubble who first noticed that our universe is expanding by noting that galaxies seem to be flying further and further apart. This implied that everything should have started with the monumental explosion of an infinitely hot, infinitely small point. This idea was jokingly referred to at the time as the Big Bang, but as the evidence piled up, the notion and the name actually stuck. We know that after the Big Bang, the universe cooled down to form the stars and galaxies that we see today. Cosmologists have plenty of ideas about how this happened. But we can also probe the origins of the universe by recreating the hot, dense conditions that existed at the beginning of time in the laboratory. This is done by particle physicists. Over the past century, Particle physicists have been studying matter and forces at higher and higher energies. 
Firstly, with cosmic rays, and then with particle accelerators, machines that smash together subatomic particles with great energies. The greater the energy of the accelerator, the further back in time they can effectively peak. Today, things are largely made up of atoms, but hundreds of seconds after the Big Bang, it was too hot for electrons to join atomic nuclei to make atoms. Instead, the universe consisted of a swirling sea of subatomic matter. A few seconds after the Big Bang, it was hotter still, hot enough to overpower the forces that usually hold protons and neutrons together in atomic nuclei. Further back, microseconds after the Big Bang, and the protons and neutrons were only just beginning to form from quarks, one of the fundamental building blocks of the standard model of particle physics. Further back still, and the energy was too great even for the quarks to stick together. Physicists hope that by going to even greater energies, they can see back to a time when all the forces were one and the same, which would make understanding the origins of the universe a lot easier. To do that, they'll not only need to build bigger colliders, but also work hard to combine our knowledge of the very, very big with the very, very small, and share these fascinating insights with each other and with, well, you. And that's how it should be, because after all, when it comes to our universe, we're all in this one together. So no, when we talk about the Big Bang and the forming of 14 billion years, and depending upon which model we use, 13.6 to 15.6 billion years ago, um, we are not even mentioned within the first part. We are a brand new species on the block, as we will see from this particular video that deals with life on Earth. Life, with an estimated 3.8 billion years of existence and evolution. This ASAP science video was made possible by the support of Audible.com. With their help, we're able to continue making fun science videos. Life. So when you think about the evolution and the development of humanity, we are a pretty remarkable species. Think about what we've done with that one minute and 17 seconds. I mean, really in a 24 hour day, and that is just for the evolution of life. We actually did that for the entire universe and do it that would have to be basically a three day period and we would still be in three days about one minute 17, one minute 18 seconds. That's all of human history. Think about behind me this lovely image of Stonehenge here in, um, in England being developed. Think about the pyramids. Think about Washington DC and all the monuments. Everything we've done from around the planet would be in this tiny infinitesimal fraction and no other animal species or plant species has had that kind of impact so quickly. There's something that makes us unique and special. The Adam and Eve is a remarkable kind of creation that actually comes. And so in the classroom, we'll take a field trip outside to demonstrate this. But with ours, if you just hold out your arm, you can see here. So if we look at the development of all humans, of all life on planet Earth, Humans are the very tip of the fingernail. That's it, just the tip of the fingernail. And that is Stonehenge, that is developing the writing, that is the internet, that is coronavirus that we're trying to currently kind of go through. That is everything that we potentially have is just the very tip of that. So for that, we have to say, we are a remarkable species. And so the question we have to ask is, what makes us special? What are some of these features? Just to show you an example, these are different wedding traditions that we developed in that one minute and 17 seconds according to the model of the 24 hour day of life. We've developed all these different traditions for marriage customs and they are radically different from color, from what you do, from who is invited, who is involved, even what the bride and groom actually perform themselves versus having others do. It's a pretty remarkable aspect. So what makes humans specials? Well, let's start off with over on the right, the most important part for us is once we develop fire, and your video, Mankind, the Story of Us, makes this very clear. Once we develop fire, and we're the only animal who uses fire like this, once we develop fire, what happens is that our stomachs no longer have to be so large, no longer have to process so much food and meat with bacteria. We only need one stomach. We don't need two, three, four, like other animals animals like the cow or um, regurgitate our food and then eat it like some birds and some cows and some other type of species do, we actually can process everything because a lot of the stuff that is bad for you, actually the fire kills, the bacteria, 
in many cases, the viruses that might be in it. And so rather than spending all that extra time on digestion, which is what dinosaurs and almost all other animals had to do, we have the remarkable accomplishment that that power slowly starts seeping up into our brain. So our intellect becomes incredibly enormous compared to almost other any other animal species. So if you look at it from the primates showing up over on here on your right, look at the size of an African bush elephant. That African bush elephant, excuse me, that African bush elephant can weigh 12,000 pounds. We on average weigh about 180 pounds. And so, but our brain is one half the size of an elephant. And so the intellect, that second order thought, the idea that we can actually refer to what other people think and how they think about it becomes a spectacular achievement that allows us to create tools and music and art and writing and the idea of participating in philosophical conversations which most other animals just don't have the brain capacity to do. There are more neural connections in your brain than all of the stars in the universe. So we have a remarkable brain machine up here largely due to fire. So we don't have to process all of that garbage that comes in for food. We become a very efficient machine and our head actually produces about 50% of our overall body, heat, which is a pretty remarkable feature. What makes humans special when we actually look at the uniqueness scale? Part of it's gonna be science. And note right beneath science is culture, our art, our music. That is what separates us from every other animal species. We know of no other animal species that makes art, that makes music. They will communicate with one another, and it might sound artful, but it's us who's actually doing the mixing when we put these tapes together, whether it's cats singing Christmas carols or whales singing to one another. We are also the only animal, excuse me, that uses math and maps out, not based upon instinctual relationships, but maps out the stars and has an idea of where the stars are for seasonality outside of just figuring it out. So it makes us pretty remarkable on this idea of creativity, imagination, philosophy. And though there's very little or very few people that believe there's nothing that makes us special. There are just some things that make us radically different than other animals because of the brain size. Let's use those brains then. As we go through when we study art, we are going to study how that human capacity, that brain, that creativity that we have, the ability to make art, the ability to think in complex ways, how it changed the world. So one of the things that I will ask you to do that it will form a good portion of your grade is that you are going to be taking notes for art history for everything that you read and everything that you watch a video on. The notes that I will be grading are only on the artworks. And so I'll be asking three questions, which you can see all the way up here at the top. So I'll move myself up so you can see those questions right next to me there. The notes for art history one and two. The first thing I'm going to ask you to do, and you can bullet this out, why did they make the artwork? Why did the artists make the artwork? Was it a commission? Was it to promote religion? Was it propaganda? Was it something for the imperial court? Was it they were trying to express love? What was it that they were trying to do when they make the artwork? The next thing, what's new and innovative? This is why artworks make the art history textbook. What's new and innovative? Is it the first time we saw a god in art? Is it the first time that we saw writing in art? Is it the first time we saw the subject of love show up? Is it the first time that we saw architecture? What is it that is new and innovative that actually drives the human condition and creativity forward? And the third question, which is often hard, and something you have to refer and reflect back upon yourself, because our books often don't do this, what's the impact? If it's the first depiction of God, why is that important? And so you can bullet these answers out. That's what you'll be handing in. You can turn them in a chart form if you would like, where you have one, two, three of the questions and the artwork, and the next artwork, and then the next artwork, just because it can be bulleted out in very short answers. I do not need this for the artists, though you can take those and use those notes also on your midterm and your final. You're basically creating a cheat sheet for your midterm or your final. This makes up 30% of your grade. So you must do this as part of our course. I will be looking at these notes once a week, um, generally on the first time I see you on the week, so I can give it back on the second time. So you can take the weekly quiz, which will be based upon what we do in class, but also your notes that show up here. So there are a couple different reading techniques that you'll be watching a video about this week. One is pseudo skimming, and you can see by the, the note down here, and I'm gonna drop myself down, show you right where it's at, there we go. The idea of pseudo skimming. 
is where you are quickly looking over for main ideas, but not actually reading every word, looking for the most important features. That is a one way of a reading technique when you get a long read. Second one is ask yourself a question while reading. One of the ways that I read when I really want to understand anything, everything, I will say, all right, after I read a second section, I will look at the section right before it that I was supposed to read beforehand. And I will go back and I will say, oh, how does this section connect to that section? Can I make the link on why there's a natural progression? And if I can, that means that I probably understand the logic behind why they're explaining you are watching this way. Taking notes while you're reading, that's what I'm encouraging you to do, or you know, I do encourage you to do it while you're reading. So you just, hey, they made the artwork for this reason. They do a new, and if you have a chart structure right in front of you, you can fill in those gaps while you're doing your reading. Another aspect would be format reading, and that is real, real, really where you are reading the formats to figure out, figure out what's the most important. Are there emboldened words that you'll really need to know because of the vocabulary words and there are new ideas so you'll know, all right, I'm probably going to be tested on this. Or there's headings and subheadings where you can look to see, all right, prehistoric art is important. Here are the subheadings because they develop sculpture, they develop jewelry. So you have an idea of looking at the subheading. So it's called format reading as you're walking through. And finally, reading backwards. Read the conclusion. Generally at the very end of a chapter, in almost all chapters in an academic textbook, there is a conclusion. And so these are all reading um, techniques. So you'll read the very end, and then you'll kind of work your way back so that you can see, oh, this is how it developed, rather than looking at, all right, here's how it developed, looking at the forward model. Either model can work within the process. All of these are called being an active reader. It will make you learn much more by reading using any of these techniques, whether it's working for my class or another class. And that brings us to the introduction to what we call prehistoric art. Prehistoric art, we generally date somewhere back around 100,000 to 4,000 BCE. 100,000 to 4,000 BCE. It's our oldest art fork on the planet. And what we have to make sure that we do is that in this class, I'll be using BCE, which means before the common era. And BC is traditionally what was used up until very recently, which means before Christ. But as we have more and more scholars around the planet that are not English speakers or are not Christian, they're not comfortable with using the bull before Christ data. They actually have their own calendars. But to make sure that we're all on the same calendar, because it's really difficult to figure out otherwise, we're going to use before the common era. One of the issues shows up is we don't use that BCE. What do we do with something like the Muslim calendar? Muslim calendar generally starts 522 or 532 years after our own calendar which basically means every time we would want to figure out a Muslim date to our date, we'd have to subtract 532 years. The same would be true from going from a Christian date to a Muslim date on their end. That's very unwieldy and academic kind of, so you would say that Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel was done between 1508 and 1512, and also 1030 to 1036, depending upon what calendar you're looking at. Jewish calendar would have a different calendar as well because, of course, their Savior, their Jesus has not come yet. So we are going to use BCE so that we all can agree to the same time frame, even though it's actually the same date as BC. The other change we're going to make is rather than AD, which means Anno Domini, it's in Latin, which means in the year of our Lord from Christ's birth and beyond, we're going to change that. It's going to be the same dates for us in the Christian world, but it's actually going to mean common era. So 0 BCE will equal 0 CE, 32 AD is still going to be 32 CE. So we get to use the same calendar, and everyone else has agreed, largely because there's more Christians on the planet. About one out of every three people on the planet is Christian. So that's why we're using that calendar. So the question that begins with is, what does prehistoric mean? We talk about it being from 100,000 to 4,000 BCE. What does it mean? Here's some different in individuals of different aspects far hairier self because we live during the ice ages in many capacities. And what does prehistoric mean? It's the era before writing. So if you don't have writing, how do you figure out what things mean? How do you know what's important, what's not important? And the key feature for all of us is going to be, we're going to use burial sites. We're gonna look at things that have been saved and preserved underground. That's probably the best aspect or if we find caves, which are fairly rare, we will look at the items that we can date in caves from radiocarbon dating. 
So the question becomes then for us during this time period, for the vast majority of human history, if we go back and look at 2.5 million years to about 100,000 years ago, or just after that, we made no art that we can find. There was nothing. There was no drawing, there was no painting, there was no jewelry. Architecture was basically living in caves. We had some clothing, but not really in an artistic fashion. It was much more just the animal clothes that we literally, we literally with very little sewing would throw over our bodies. So the question is, why start making art? We have to invent that concept. That's a new invented concept, and one of the more important ideas in the history of art. And so it could be for education, it could be we come up with a religion. It could be there are certain concepts that when we're talking and grunting at one another and trying to explain, oh, I love you, I have feelings for you. We have no way of physically expressing that. So we need a visual manipulation of that. And so when you think about the bottom question in relation to the top, why do humans start making art? The reflection becomes, why do humans make art today? We are still the same evolutionary species with very little to no changes over the last 100,000 years. Even our skin color, when we talk about racial difference, that is not a special difference at all. That is a social contract based upon how much melanin we have. So even color, whether you were born in Africa or Oceania, that's something that can be manipulated pretty quickly over time, and it's not a way of, of separating us out. And so why do humans make art today? They probably made art for the same reasons back then. And so what are the subjects of our first artworks? If you're living in a cold, cave-like environment, what are the subjects of your art going to be? We're a hunter-gatherer society. So most people say some of our first artworks are going to be on hunting and gathering. And that's absolutely true. Our first artworks are going to be drawings, um, and largely drawings of animals, many of the animals that we are going to eat. Some of them we've actually even hunt to extinction. Saved us soon, Professor Fraser at CJIU. He was one of the hundred greatest art works of all time. Thank you, former President Bill Clinton, member of the CGIU, which Miami Dade College is a member of. We get to go in and see President Bill Clinton about once a year um, as he hosts a particular conference for movers and shakers within the college community that we take. A fair number of our honor students, but also our non honor students, get selected to go. And he's introduced us to one of the most important artworks that changed the world. And ironically, I used his clip specifically for female beauty because of his, shall we say, indiscretions with female beauty as they're showing up. So this is the artworks that changed the world. The artwork in front of us is called The Woman of Willendorf. It used to be called The Venus of Willendorf, but of course the Greeks haven't lived yet, so there is no Venus, and we don't know if it's a love goddess or not. So this is an artwork that changed the world because it's our first attempt at sculpture. Um, we've done some drawings before. Some are more realistic than others in the cave paintings. And the first subject then that we ever really have in sculpture may have been naked women. Men have always had a one-track mind. Here she is dancing. You see, most of them have enlarged breasts and large hips. And that has led some to question whether or not she is actually pregnant. But if you look all over the bodies, you will note, and here's some different examples. If you look all over those bodies, None of those bodies really appears with the way the fat and the way that the, the breasts are enlarged appear to be pre pregnant, excuse me. Almost none of them have any facial features. So that's an odd feature as well within the process. And so the question comes down, we have three basically explanations that we don't know which one's right. We need to ask some questions to help us decide the meaning. Is this a fertility goddess? Is this just about beauty or is it porn? And we would need to know what questions would help you ascertain or figure out the meaning. So here's the pregnant female, a beauty female, and a pornographic female. And what questions would you decide or need to know to answer? So if you asked who held it? Well, what we do believe is we find these in hunter burial sites. Hunters are the ones who go off on their own, coming back hopefully with food to feed all of us. They wear these, they're about three and a half to four inches tall, they're very tiny, and they generally have holes in them so you can wear them around your neck as jewelry. It's only men hunters that we actually ever find wearing them. Note the no face, so that's not important, but even though there's no face, they do emphasize the breast. She does have arms, as you can see, maybe you can't see. They are spread across the breast, right up here are the arms, there's one, there's the other. 
No, even though there's no face and maybe there's a hat or a shell, no, they do put the slit for the vagina. So they are still interested on the biological kind of pubic triangle that shows up here. Women do die very frequently in childbirth during the prehistoric era. Probably one in every five women die in childbirth, somewhere around 20% is our estimate. When we look at the hat or the headdress, is it a hairstyle? If it's a hairstyle, why on earth is it actually covering the face? That would be an odd feature. Is it shells? Is it a hat specifically for the cold weather? Is it decoration? I don't know if that adds anything to the fertility goddess, the beauty, or the pornography. Then when we start comparing, comparing it to this, women during this time period, it is impossible to, for them to have this body. There is not enough food around. So the biggest women we've ever found from burial sites were somewhere around 100 pounds. So they're very, very, very thin. And the thinnest women can be as small as 85 pounds. Guys, we're not going to have it much better. We're going to be about 125 to 135 pounds. And we found men as small as about 115 pounds from what we can tell from people in burial sites. And so it was almost impossible for a woman to have this shape body in any way, shape, or form during the time period. And so she could not have this. And so that leads some people to say she's idealized beauty. Men and women want what they can't have. It's almost impossible to have any of those bodies on the right right? They've been photoshopped. They had health plans. They have spray on tans. So even after they wake up in the morning with everything else, we photoshop them even after. Those women do not wake up and look exactly like that. Sorry guys for that dismay. And so if we look at this as a comparison, if women are seeing this, and this is the model of beauty that happens to be out there, what are women going to feel about their bodies? Right? This is their Marilyn Monroe. The play. They know they can't achieve this body. They know this is the body that men probably pr prefer. And let's face it, in an Ice Age environment, this body is a good body to have. Right? You can feed your children. You have fat, which actually has reserves. So if you don't eat, you won't starve. You're much more fun to snuggle up with someone who has some fat to actually keep everyone warm during the time period. So this is a more healthy body, actually, for someone who's living in a cave during the Ice Ages to survive. But if that's what you're looking up to as the model of beauty, and you can only have half of that, because let's face it, this woman is somewhere probably in the neighborhood of 200 pounds, 180 to 200 pounds, and you only weigh about 115, that's a remarkable kind of change to know whether or not you can actually be seen as that sex model within your own society. The other comparison that comes up, potentially she's a fertility goddess, like the Virgin Mary or like the Madonna. So if that's the case, what does it tell us about the body and what we're looking at? The fat part would not matter. The obesity would not matter within the process. But then that would mean that this woman has to be pregnant. And most of the features don't look like the woman is pregnant, except for the enlarged stomach. Everything else seems to be enlarged as well, not just the stomach. And so when we look at different styles of art, the Venus of Willendorf for here, as we look at gender equality, the Venus of Willendorf, that's the first men's artwork that we have. We believe men make it, made it. It's the size of a rock that would fit in a man's hand that could be pounded with another rock without breaking any fingers. We think it took somewhere around four to six weeks of full-time work to make that rock. So this is rock on rock architecture or rock and rock sculpture, sorry. We believe Lascaux Caves was done by men and women. And that's by the hand prints that are up. We actually see spray hand prints, women throwing out kind of food or different materials that would leave their hand print about the size of a female hand, much smaller than a male hand. And so we need to look at the differences between the two. So how do men's and women's focus different when they're making art? Well, the women themselves are, first off, the men, as they're looking at the Venus of Willendorf, no matter what we think, it's about sex. It's either fertile sex to have children. It's either pornographic sex to take care of their needs when they're not at home, worn as jewelry by hunters going away, or they are beautiful dolls of what they would like to have sex with, even though it might not be pornographic in terms of fertility figure. 
So a fertility goddess within this process that's pregnant. Note the female model or the female male model together. It's much more about realism. It's about survival. It's basically making a prehistoric shopping list. That's what I want to wear. That's what I want to eat. That's what I want to wrap my baby in. That's what I want diapers for my baby in. You are actually choosing a particular animal. And note the animals are so realistic that we actually can find in burial sites the actual coats that match up with the animals on the wall. So it's not just like they're making a horse. They're making Bob the horse and then going out and hunting Bob the horse. They don't give Bob the horse. One of the interesting things we find, they paint over animals that we don't find the coats for, which means they probably went out and hunted that animal. They couldn't either kill it or couldn't find it. So they went back and they started the process again. To show you men's infinity with the sexual female figure, should not surprise anyone by today's standard. Here's a spoof of the cave paintings. And of course, the cave paintings did not look like this. Only the Venus of Willendorf figures look like this. And there are multiple different Venus figures I should mention. There is the Venus of Paris, because she was found in Paris. There's the Venus of London. So they're found all throughout Europe, and they're named by either woman or Venus for wherever they're found. So if we look at this particular video, as I talk a bit more about the cave paintings, here are the 15 most beautiful, spectacular cave paintings that we have found throughout Europe. And you'll see a number of them that we'll be talking about within the process. These, the size will vary. They can be life-size or they can be overly life-size. They can be also very, very small. They do paint, excuse me, they do paint over ones that they miss. So we believe there's this concept that if they don't get it right or can't get it accurate enough to capture the soul, they go out and they will hunt it again. This process I'll show you in a minute is called sympathetic magic. You'll note some of them have arrows and things that have been shot into them, showing that we want to kill the spirit or we ritually are killing them to make it easier for people to go out, which may give us the rise to our first spiritual force that shows up. We're gonna see a whole range of different animals from cows, um, all the way to horses, to rhinoceroses, to elephants. Many of the animals actually have since gone extinct. And we see stylistic differences. For example, whether something comes from North Africa, it's a little bit more abstract than the ones in Europe, which are a little bit more realistic. So people themselves had differentiated across the different cave areas too. So he, these are coming from North Africa where you see the giraffes. The people, when they painted in caves, they only painted in caves where they did not live. So these are ritual places, and you note that people are basically done as stick figures. So you can almost not identify who is who amongst the different people. Leading credence that these are probably sympathetic magic type aspects that show up, which I'll show you that, that in a moment. And this is not a very accurate film, but the crudes, if you've seen it. All right, so the birth of spirituality might be taking place here. This is called sympathetic magic. This is where men and women work together to kill the powerful animals, where women mostly kill the spirit, and then men go out and kill the real animal. If they miss the real animal or can't find it, they come back and they paint over whatever happens to be there before. Now remember, the animals are not always there. A lot of this takes place during the ice ages, so the animals migrate. So you have a vested interest in getting everything perfectly right in these darkened caves, crawling up and holding on to different aspects. And they're gonna use a lot of spray painting through a reed, basically which could be simulated through a straw, which we may or may not do in class. Now, we still have sympathetic magic in modern world because we have some semi-prehistoric cultures. We still have cultures today that actually have not converted over to writing. One being the San Kalahari group from modern day Namibia with their rock paintings. And what we will notice is exactly the same thing. Notice how people are jumping over the bulls and running around the bulls all the way up on the top over here. So you can't identify any individual. That way you can't capture the soul. Whereas the animals themselves, you can see the differentiation of what you're going to go and hunt. So you'd be ready to go and hunt and kill those particular animals. That's good verification that this is probably accurate. How we could check to see if sympathetic magic is accurate in the prehistoric world? Well, we could actually look for the realism. So this is called the the Hall of the Bulls, and look how realistic the Hall of the Bulls are. Now remember, they do not live in these caves, so these are special caves they go into paint to eat. Now what's really remarkable, remember, these people are almost on the verge of starving to death. 
There's not a lot of food. They're hunters and gatherers. They're living largely during the ice ages. And yet they're willing to put food and other materials in their mouth, mix it with their saliva, and then shoot it out. If you don't catch the animal, that is wasted food. If you do catch the animal, though, that is actually a gold mine because not only do you get the coat for, for clothing, you get the meat, you get the rib, you get the sinew, which you can use as rope, you get the stomach lining and the bladder, which you can use for water bottles. So this really is like the Native American culture. They're going to use every part of the animal that they find. And so here are our rock-drawn particular stick-like figures showing that, all right, we're not going to make people so realistic because we do not want to capture their soul and therefore make it more likely that the animal kills them rather than us killing the animal. So here's a recreation of the Lascaux Caves, Yard's creation. Note how dark they are. They're all subterranean below ground. And so you would actually have to bring in little oil lamps to be able to light the area, kind of like a cell phone light, just to be able to see up on the walls to know that you were getting everything right. There were three painting techniques. And this is why we know that a number of the paintings were done by women. There's hand as well as finger painting. They do stick drawing, but most of the painting is actually done through spray painting. So if you actually see all the way over here on the right where there are the dots, that basically is charcoal black by other materials. They put in their mouth, they saliva it up, and they shoot it out to a straw. When something gets stuck, you get a little bit of a stutter within the lines as you're going through to make the paintings. In class, then, we'll let you try all three different techniques. And basically, you will have to choose a, a wildebeest, any wildebeest you want. But note, you're going to have to make a quick drawing of the wildebeest because those wildebeests, A, migrate, and B, you're not painting on a canvas right in front of them like the Impressionist. You have to go underground in a dark cave, remembering what your wildebeest or your new looks like to be able to reproduce it so that your husband, your uh, sons, your boyfriends, whoever relationships that you have that are going to go out and hunt, they're going to have to be able to find that one wildebeest from all these other wildebeests after they move. It's pretty impressive. Here you go. Pick a wildebeest, any wildebeest to draw. We'll turn off the lights in a moment because you're gonna draw in the dark. So as we look through this, a lot of these early exhibits that were actually created, this is the Disney exhibit in Spaceship Earth from 1971. You'll note almost everything is wrong about it from what our current day understanding is. And that's because in 1971, we had mostly male scholars. We hadn't really measured the finger widths. We hadn't found that many burial sites. Now that we've found all that information, our knowledge has radically transformed on what these images would have looked like. There would be a lot more female painters up here. It would have been much less lit. Um, there would have been much more crowded and cavernous. This really does look like they're painting in the caves where they were living. Picasso, basically after seeing the Lascaux Caves, was found right during Picasso's life. It's the first case that came out. It says, we have learned nothing, seeing the cave art, about how primitive. And you'll note, this actually has a drawings of different bulls from Guernica that is based upon the cave drawing. Once you saw the cave art, he did an entire series of cave art, including, here's one of this cave art where he's demonstrate how he's painting very similar to the way that the cave painters did. That's actually Picasso himself drawing. And he had an entire exhibit of this, lit in the dark only by candlelight. So it had that flickering light like these individuals would have painted his European predecessors. Cave paintings are used constantly in the, co in the modern day imagination. The one on the left is actually from Disney itself. You can see one from Simba and the painting of the cave painting. And for Game of Thrones fans, actually we'll get there in a moment, a couple spoofs, damn kids in their graffiti, dad coming home, of course they didn't paint in those caves. Of course a very valuable woman would be a woman that can paint them, and so we probably believe in equality during this time period, where men and women, sympathetic magic says men and women work together to make sure that everyone survives. And if you are fans of Game of Thrones, there's cave paintings in Game of Thrones talking about the White Walkers. So if we start playing this, Little forge where they walk into the cave with Jon Snow and they form a tandem. This is when they decide they're going to fight together. Standing where we're standing. Before there were Targaryens or Starks or Lannisters. Maybe even before there were men. No.
They were here together. The children in the first land. Doing what? Fighting each other. And this, if you're a Game of Thrones fan, is where they decided they're going to have to fight the they White Walkers together. together. Against their common enemy. Despite their differences, despite their suspicions. And so we use a lot of these cave paintings, even in modern day kind of artwork that shows up. And so the last artwork that I want to introduce you to is Stonehenge. Thank you, Morgan Freeman, of Academy Award winning actor, Morgan Freeman, for introducing Stonehenge to us, talking about the great civilizations are known by their great artworks. And what makes and marks the difference here between Stonehenge versus our early artworks is the megalithic, megalithic giant rock sculpture that shows up is very different than, than kind of more individualistic images that we've seen before. If we do what's called visual thinking strategies, where we ask you, what can you learn about an artwork by just looking and analyzing, which we'll do in class if I ask you to look at this artwork, you can tell me pretty quickly, this is a large scale civilization, right? They're moving rocks from 100 miles away. There's got to be a reason for those particular rocks versus our, our rocks that are in the right area. Why a circle? You know, why is this matched up for both the astronomy, um, the cosmology of looking at how the sun rises and sets and how the moon rises and sets. Once we start looking at that, we get a much more complicated. And so the, the two artworks we looked at before were called Paleolithic, basically old rock or old stone age. This is Neolithic. We are getting much more into the modern day world. We're on the verge, the precipice of inventing things such as agriculture. And eventually Stonehenge people will invent some agriculture. The pre, the, I'm sorry, the Mesopotamians, which we'll see next week, invented it first. So they get farming mother, but both societies are developing just about the same time period. One in a prehistoric world without writing, Mesopotamians invent writing, so they're actually in the next phase of human development. Now, one of the key features about Stonehenge is the following. It is the longest art project in human history. We spend nearly 1,500 years to make a single artwork. Now that artwork, imagine today spending 1,500 years. We're basically in 2020. We're gonna say in the United States of America, we're gonna spend 10% of our military, 10% of our economy now until 3720 to actually make an artwork. That is an enormous accomplishment. It is a normal, an enormous kind of use of time and money resources. And so, there's very few projects that we would ever do that for. And in class, we talked about it. What are the two things that you potentially would use that kind of time, money, and energy on? Okay, one's going to be religion. The other one's going to be on survival. So this is the first calendar. And when do we need to know about calendars? When do we need to know fall, spring? It's the agricultural cycle. Because unlike living in Miami or in Southern Florida or in Texas or California, where there are food that grows year round, in most parts of the world, most habitable parts of the world, food grows for between three and six months. And if you miss the due date and you take the seed out of the ground too late, it freezes, it won't crop up and grow crops the next year. So you starve the next year. So it's so important to get that agricultural calendar right, both from a planting perspective, when the rains are gonna come perspective, the harvest perspective, getting seeds out of the ground so that you don't starve the following year. This agricultural calendar still works today. It took so long because if you look at the, the image on the right, the prehistoric tools, that's what they made it with. They used shells for scrapers. They had other rocks they would bang in. And these things, you can see the size of the people around Stonehenge itself. That's these figures right here are the actual individual. These monoliths, each one of these giant single rocks are about 18 feet tall. They weigh somewhere around 50,000 pounds. Now, there are multiple different stages of building. And we know so little about the Stonehenge builders that we don't even give them a name. We actually call them the Stonehenge building people. It's, and that's what we know, 1,500 years. We don't know why the site was abandoned, but we do know they started off by digging a giant circular moat around. Then they dragged in these rocks over 1,000 years and shaped them. 
in the shape of a large U. Then there was an outside circle that was put on it. And throughout the period, as very powerful, we do believe men um, that worked on the site died, 24 of them and only 24 of them were buried. So that's about one every 40 years was buried in this outside sarsen, which England currently has refused to excavate. So we don't actually know what the burial sites look like. Now, these sleds, because they hadn't invented the wheel yet, they also don't have a pack animal yet, which means when they're gonna build these sleds, they know that they're gonna to have to push rocks. They're gonna to have to push those 50,000 pound rocks an enormous distance in order for this to work. So it's a pretty remarkable accomplishment on what they're able to do. And it does show you, man, this society had to have a huge amount of, of civilization, of a political elite, because someone has to grow crops to feed these people while they're working on the project. Now, one of the things that always shows up is just because we don't know how they build it, people will often rely on the trope and say, well, it's not us, it was made by aliens. I want to shout out and absolutely tell you, this is definitively false. Stonehenge was not made by aliens, it was not made by, a, by, a, by ET. As we saw in our video with the length of the hand and that we just live on the tip, we are one of the most remarkable creatures in the history of humanity. Our brain power is spectacular. And just because we don't know how they did it, doesn't mean that they did not do it. Even today, there's only about 10 cranes in the entire world that can lift the weights that are that of the stones to the top of what Stonehenge was done. So this basically tells us the following, that with hard work and energy, you are a member of perhaps the most amazing evolutionary species on earth. We are really cool when we put our minds together. We create things like Stonehenge that even today, our head scratchers on, how did we do that? We, we don't currently have a definitive evidence that shares all the evidence with us. It would use as an agricultural calendar. It's also a lunar calendar. So at any point during, throughout the, the year, if you go there and you tell me three points of information, I need three of the following four, I can tell you what day of the year it is because there's a map here. Tell me, where did the sun rise? Where did the sun set? Where did the moon rise? And where did the moon set over which rocks? Give me three of those four pieces of information. I'll say, oh, it's June 13th. Oh, it's April 14th. It's still accurate within literally a fraction of an inch today, 3,000 years after it was made. And here's the sun rising over the summer solstice. So it's that accurate. One of the things that's truly remarkable is that if you look at it, it's one of our first forms of architecture, man-made architecture outside of caves and using mammoth bones. Our first real form of architecture is called post and lintel. Note the post is this large upright here. The lintel is the piece across. That is still the most common form of architecture today. Look around at almost any window in your house, you'll see post and lintel. Look around at Miami-Dade College. This is post and lintel. Look around the White House. We have fancy posts called columns that the Greeks are going to use, and then the lintel across the top. It's a pretty remarkable and versatile form of architecture, most common form of architecture still today on the planet. Stonehenge is a burial site for 24 burials. We have not excavated any of them. This is about as close as we ever got with one of the burial sites. And the English government stopped them because they wanted to make sure that in the future, when we have better technology and technique, we don't disrupt any because we don't know who's buried there. If they're kings, if they're part of the Stonehenge beaker, um, people that were actually making the site, we just don't know anything. And the other thing is that this is potentially one of the coolest finds in most recent memory. So I'm teaching Stonehenge slightly differently. This area right here was our first public music venue. And that is because Stonehenge itself, while it's a perfect circle, all of the stones are also shaped circular on the inside and on the outside. So it's literally a perfect circle. So when you bang, you can see my table banging. When you bang, the waves of the sound go out to Stonehenge to hit the post. They hit the post and they wave back. And when all of them come back at the same time, it acts as an amplifier. So you play a piece of music, the waves go out, they all come back in, synchron in synchronicity in a wave function at the same, so it acts like a mini amplifier. And so if you play the music loud enough, the earth literally shakes here. You can create an earthquake. So on some level, if you think about how we talk about Mother Earth, 
they literally had figured out a way of talking and communicating with Mother Earth, which is a pretty spectacular thing for a music, almost a trance music, to feel the vibrations of the earth like mini earthquakes. And so it became a huge tourist site in our first Roth concert. As it's in England, Banksy, of course, made his version of it out of portable toilets. And showing the disrepair it's in, largely because the Romans first off are the people who knocked it down. And that largely brings us to this. Now that we've looked at three major prehistoric arts, and as I mentioned, one of the things I want to emphasize is that I'm not going to teach you about every artwork in the book. I want to give you the hallmarks that basically you can actually take that and extrapolate for any other prehistoric artwork to you know what artwork looks like. So as we are looking at doing our midterm, which is the nationalized midterm, where we compete with the best schools um, all across the country, you have your questions in front of you. You'll note this is under your prehistoric syllabus, or under the syllabus under prehistoric arts. If you look at that middle column where it says essential and midterm questions, this is one of your major midterm questions. Does prehistoric art deal with the same concepts and functions as art today? So this can be a bulleted out answer, and the grading rubric is the following. If you can give me 12 to 15 points across these three artworks, that's an A. 10 to 11 points is a B. 8 to 9 points is a C. Now, it's only an A, B, or C if you make a case. Yes, it does because of these features, or no, it doesn't because of these features. So I'll give you a couple of minutes, and in class, we'll do this activity as well. Can you come up with what are the major issues across these three artworks? So can you come up with 15? You don't need to have five for Venus of Willen or five for Lascaux. You could have seven for one and eight for another and none for the third one. You just have to let us know which ones are still used in terms of concepts and functions in our art today. And are there more that are used for our art today? Are people in the ancient world just like us today? Or is there something different? And so if we look at it, here's the, one of them from a couple years ago that they came up with. We make a lot of art in yellow about idealism, not a lot about fertility, a lot about porn, a lot about beauty, gender roles and jewelry, a lot about realism, very few artworks about shopping lists. We don't draw, hey, buy me a cow. Very little about survival, very little about sympathetic magic, a lot about future-oriented investment collaboration, not very much about calendar and agriculture, a lot about post and lintel, it's our dominant form of architecture, a lot about the community working together, a lot about burials, a lot about music, ritual, and tourism. And so if you look at how, how much the yellow, the answer is definitively yes. These people are very similar to us, just without electricity and the modern day tools. They cared about education, they cared about a better life, they cared about um, guaranteeing that the future, investing in the future so that they could actually have a better life with feeding and making sure the calendar, they're very similar to us. Based upon the aesthetic features and where the aesthetic features of the art, simple tools, survival, limited details, naive concepts at the very beginning, realism versus idealism, small scale except in architecture, they were often portable or something that we for individual or family use and sympathetic magic and painting so the human truth comes up humans have common concerns but very different responses to life based upon their environment if they, if we looked at the prehistoric world as it developed in africa versus in europe they would have the same concepts even their rock paintings look very similar their early sculptures look very similar but as they start to develop civilizations they come up with new solutions Right? There's not a lot of food because it's the ice age. Africa, there's a lot more food and game animals out there. So that's not their priority nearly as such as it was in Africa. And so the last thing, which of the artworks based upon the aesthetic features and what we know, which of these artworks is likely prehistoric art, which use those simple tools, that naive concepts. And I will mention there are three of these that are prehistoric artwork. Can you find them? Good, one is gonna be the mammoth bone house. Good, one is gonna be this covered mound, which is just dirt over a rock mound in Newgrange. And good, this figure here. The other two have too many stylistic details and facial features to actually be considered um, prehistoric art. So those are actually gonna be from our next period, Mesopotamian art. And the last thing, I want you to have the experience of what these artists had before. So one of your assignments coming up in the next week is you are going to go find two different rocks and you are going to bang them together to make me a human or animal form. We're going to do a rock out assignment. It's your turn to create prehistoric art. 
you will spend minimally one hour creating the shape. And two things. Number one, please make sure you wear goggles. So when you bang rocks together, if you've never done that before, the rock pieces can come off at about 60 miles an hour faster than you can potentially blink. So we don't need anyone coming in with an eye like a pirate. The other thing is make sure you're watching what you're doing, that when you're banging, you don't bang your finger. Because then we have a pirate peg leg and I am a pirate now. We don't need to see any of that within the process. So please take safety precautions. Part number two, choose two different styles of rock. One really great rock is outside of our, um, our building, as long as you promise to bring it back. You have some lovely quartz rocks over there, which are really good as the banging rocks. Most rocks you're going to find are going to be softer than that. The one rock that we have around here that's almost impossible to carve is basalt. It's a dark, very dark black, or very dark gray. It's incredibly heavy. If you get that rock, use that as your batting rock, because that will beat into anything. If you can find some coral rock, coral rock will almost flake off, so a little banging, and you'll be able to get to that shape very, very quickly. Don't glue the rocks together. There is no super glue. That's not the assignment. The assignment is to bang rocks together. Why? Because if the artwork behind me, Stonehenge, was made like this, that's why it took 1,500 years, then you can actually get an experience of what it would have felt like and the overwhelming power of making one of these artworks. Remember, to make a small little Venus of Willendorf figure that's four, three to four inches tall, that would take four to six weeks of full-time work. But you had a very soft rock. So good luck. I will be looking at those next week. The end. Sorry, I have to show you animal butts. Writing has not been invented yet, so I just can't use the end. Have a great day. I hope everything is well, and I look forward to when we start talking about Mesopotamia.